Below them lies one of the most beautiful and exciting cave dives known. Sally Ward is a cave rich in visions of the most unusual kind. There's one tight restriction for Gavin and Mandy to negotiate on the way in. Many people I speak to feel that all cave diving is like this. They ask me, how on earth can you do it? Why do you do it? They think all cave diving is about claustrophobia. In reality, squeezes are not all that common, and they're worth pushing for the rewards that lie beyond. Diving is a highly technical sport, dependent upon the use of the proper equipment and a strict adherence to the rules. Equipment checks and air management planning are routine preliminary to every dive before venturing into the underwater Spelian world. While swimming down passages like this, one has to wonder at how these beautiful tunnels have formed. Time and water are the essential ingredients required to make these caves. Mildly acidic water flowing through fractures and bedding planes slowly and continuously dissolves away the limestone. After many thousands of years, passages often begin to take on an elliptical shape, what geologists call phreatic tubes. These sinuous networks of tunnels can extend for miles. Most common fish we find inside these caves are several varieties of catfish, lemons, bullheads, and channels. The fact that catfish are naturally nocturnal and are not particularly choosy about what they eat makes them well suited for life inside caves. Tom Morse, expedition biologist. There's a pair of catfish in the Devil's Eye that's they're almost a mile back, and it seems like every time we go there, they're there. The only way to find out what they're eating would be to kill them and open them up, you know, and take a look. And nobody really has wanted to do that yet. The cave walls tell their own story. 26 million years ago, all the rock we see now would have been part of a great coral reef that extended for hundreds of miles along the ocean floor. Megadon, a giant ancestor of the great white shark, used to cruise those early waters. within the caves, far removed from sunlight, we find one of the cave's most unusual inhabitants, the blind albino crayfish. These guys are true troglobites in that they have evolved over thousands of years to living their entire existence in a world of perpetual darkness. Tom Morse. There's an old fella who's pretty much the crayfish expert in the southeastern United States. And when he was a graduate student, at the University of Florida in Gainesville, he collected some crayfish out of one of the caves and put them in an aquarium. Well, he's an old man now, and those crayfish are still alive. 
And the interesting thing here is that a normal surface crayfish only lives for a couple years at most. And there's certain evidence that these cave crayfish have somehow or the other stretched out their lifetimes. They live for a long time. And there's indirect evidence that they may live 10, 20 times the lifetime that a normal surface crayfish lives. So they have stretched their lives out, probably in some sort of a response to low availability of food and that sort of thing. We don't know why, but it's kind of interesting. These guys have figured out a secret for longevity. During the last ice age, some 20,000 years ago, these passages were dry. At that time, man and animal frequented the caves. In an alcove, something catches Gavin's eye. Gavin, what have you found? Well, we were just down there doing some shots of the catfish with Pete, and um, I swam into an alcove to look for some more fish. And there were a load of bones in there. There's, uh, there's one complete one, probably about six, eight inches long, actually laying on top of the sand. And I spotted that first. And then uh, just looking around in the sand, all the, there's lots of little bones sticking out the sand. Some of them are actually quite large, probably a foot long, um, really, really old, sort of dead black, um, sort of really brown black color. And um, they just, you know, I don't know what they are, but they uh, certainly look interesting. I think we're going to have to get somebody in the know to have a look at them. 30 years ago, Wally Jenkins and Gary Salzman were among the first to dive Wakulla Springs. The discoveries they made were both important and unexpected. Well, we were students at Florida State University, Wally and I, and had spent a good bit of time diving the springs in small caves in this area. But none of them were ever as clear and deep as Wakulla, it being kind of a the the big fella in this region. And uh, when we tried for some years to get permission to go in here, and were unable to until 1955. Well, we were testing a depth gauge, Gary and I, and uh, we got down to the bottom and saw a large piece of limestone. It was kind of interesting. I swam over to it, and there on the bottom was a mastodon leg bone about, oh, I don't know, 40 pounds of weight, about three and a half feet long. And I looked around, there's some more. So I found mastodon skeletons, which we didn't know were down there. So, you know, we just lost all interest in uh, the limestone formation and everything else. And I started squeaking like you can do on the water and called Gary over with a squeaky voice. And he came over and we were exuberant. Uh, remains of mastodons. Then we went on to find mammoths, and mastodons, camels, deer, sloth. And of course, we always were looking for human remains. And, uh, or a bone with an arrowhead in it with the bone growing around the arrowhead to show that humans had actually shot the mastodon while it was living. We found a midget mastodon, his jaw was it was very small, but the teeth were completely worn down. And he'd be like maybe one-fourth the size of a full-grown animal. Uh, found a tusk over seven feet long that goes into a, a jawbone, which we covered up and left down there just for safety's sake. Well, it was, it was obviously the most interesting discovery that we had made on any of the cave dives in this area. We'd found a few minor artifacts, but never anything this large. It was quite exciting to actually find the bones inside the cave like that. It brought up all sorts of interesting uh, thoughts in our mind about the cave perhaps having been inhabited by man. And this is one of the things that we then started to prove or try to prove on, on subsequent dives. Because it was impossible to swim these massive bones to the surface, Gary and Wally invented a makeshift method of raising them. By inflating a pillowcase lined with a plastic bag, they were able to create just enough lifting force to bring the enormous petrified bones to the surface. In the end, enough bones were recovered from the depths of the spring for the Museum of Florida History to be able to reconstruct an entire mastodon skeleton. 
Paleontologist Peter Caldry explains. Standing beside me is the fully articulated skeleton of a long extinct mastodon. In life, this animal stood higher than nine feet at the shoulder, was longer than 16 feet, weighed something over 10 tons, ate some 300 pounds of leafy vegetation each day just to, just to stay alive, and died 12,000 years ago in the waters of Wakulla Springs. During the time period that Florida's environment was so dry, the springs became very important drawing places for all the animals to get and satisfy their liquid needs and their water intake. But the problem is that because the sea level and therefore the water table level were so much lower, the access to the caves was much more steep than it is now. Trapping some of the larger animals near the bottom and preserving them until they could be found by later divers, such as those that are working now in Wakulla Springs today. But the reason we cave dive is not so much to discover the past, but rather for the exhilarating feeling of exploring the unknown, to experience the weightless feeling of gliding through water that is as clear as air itself. As they drop down to 120 feet, Mandy and Gavin come to a room that staggers the imagination, a huge water-filled cathedral surrounded by white limestone walls. Normal diving procedures require decompression after extended dives at depth. Decompression is the process of ascending in stages, each of a prescribed time, to allow excess nitrogen to dissipate from the body. Special tables have been developed to guide divers through this process. The dives we're planning for Wakulla aren't quite that simple. Down there, we plan to use a variety of exotic synthetic gases to avoid certain physiological problems. Diving physician, Dr. Noel Sloan. The most obvious problem with deep cave diving exploration is in this particular project, are the absolutely massive volumes of gas required to support divers at such depths. For example, in depths uh, ranging in 300 feet, such as what we're exploring here, the volumes of gas required to fill the lungs are 10 times the volume required at the surface. Most sport diving is done on compressed air, which is 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen. However, this type of very deep cave diving exploration, even oxygen at 21% can be poisonous to the body, causing such things as convulsions, permanent lung damage, and even death. How deep would you be going? It should be about 290, 280, 290. If I have anything to do with it, we're going to bring the line up to about 260 if we can. But the cave may not cooperate. In order to dive safely at depth, we need some sort of safe, inert gas to dilute the oxygen with. As I mentioned earlier, nitrogen is the common gas. However, nitrogen is not ideal because at depth, you get a problem called nitrogen narcosis. For example, at a depth of about 200 feet, 
a typical diver would feel like he'd had a couple of bottles of champagne. At 300 feet, as in this cave diving exploration, the diver would be totally non-functional. By substituting helium for nitrogen, we can totally avoid the problems of nitrogen narcosis. The diver can be very clear-headed, even at extremely deep depths. One of the problems with helium is that it has a very high thermal conductivity. What that means is that with helium, the diver is going to get much colder than with nitrogen. And on several hour dives, this can become a major problem for the diver. The second and more complex problem, however, is that with helium mixtures, decompression requires much longer periods of time than it does on compressed air. It also requires a vast array of special gas mixtures. The diver first has to switch to a special nitrox mixture, then to air, and then to 100% oxygen. This may sound fairly complex, but diving on mixed gas is really fun. Bill, you want me to move that up a little bit? No, let's, let's, let's bring it down here. Swing it down so we can put that plate on. Okay. On the spring bank, the team is busy yeah. assembling the superstructure of what will become one of the key pieces to conquering the unknown depths of Wakala. When completed, this unique structure will be used as underwater living quarters, allowing divers to decompress in relatively dry comfort. Go, go, go. We rip. Okay, control. Is that going to be enough? Okay, Pat, can you put some uh, quarter inch through there? Go in the bottom. Okay, um, Clark, what we need to do is, is tighten all those guys down there and then start seeing if we can fit the uh, the deck sections in on top just to make sure everything is going to fit correctly. Okay. And then I would I would go back around to the main connection points, uh, each of these three locations. Snug them down. The ones that have washers, go ahead and snug those down. Okay. Uh, and then we can work our way back to the bottom and get those down there. Such a structure is not normally necessary for diving, but there is little that is normal about this team and their plans to explore the massive underwater cave. By trapping a bubble of air within the spherical section of the frame, a Jules Verne fantasy living underwater will be turned into reality. At the edge of the spring, a large alligator observes the underwater construction. For who knows where the next meal is coming from? Perhaps I'll take a closer look at the menu. Hmm, maybe I'll come back when they're open. Eighteen thousand pounds of lead will be required to hold down the habitat. Individual pods will be assembled together, but getting them into position proves to be more than we bargained for. small problem. We've uh, lost two of the, uh, the primary uh, ballast cylinders uh, the, when they were moving the, the crane in, uh, uh, rotated around and bumped a couple of the ones that were in the station there at 20 feet and they fell straight over the edge to 100 foot depth. 
we sent two of our divers down to, uh, to look for it, and all they could find was a, a smoke trail going down into the tunnel. And uh, so at this point, we've actually got to send a, a recovery team down to uh, see if we can find them. And uh, we anticipate that if we can, if we can find them, uh, we're going to have to take a, a two-ton lift bag down for each one, uh, inflate it on the spot, and hopefully be able to recover it uh, directly from there up to the site where we're assembling the habitat. Uh, found one weight, exposed, easy access, 100 feet, can't find second. Uh, my schedule, 216, 2355. Others may be shorter. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome everyone down here in Walkola Springs State Park, out here on our glass bottom boat tour. Now, for all of you who have never been on this trip before, I think you might be a little surprised at all I'm going to find you out here before I bring you back. Now going out here, this trip is all now to that glass. We going to talk and tell you all about the river, all about the spring, and all about the... My God, Gavin, what happened down there? Oh. It looked like a depth charge went off up here. Yeah, we've just been trying to get back the lead pod that we lost. Um, I was down on the airbag, filling it up with the airline, and it was stirring up all the silt out the bottom. And it, we just had to put so much air in it to get it to unstick from the bottom. But once it did, it just took off like a missile. I don't know what happened, because it was just covered in silt. I couldn't see a thing. There was a, an enormous bang as it went up. And then an incredible thud, and it landed quite near, close beside me. And then as the silk started to clear, there was just large lumps of rock coming down all over the place, and just everybody thinning in all directions, trying to get out of the way. I, I don't know where the pod went. I didn't see it after that, but uh, it was pretty scary. I couldn't see a thing going on down there. I could just see people thinning everywhere, and I was just wondering where Leo was and where uh, Tara went, because I knew they were pretty close to me at the time. But I think everybody's uh, okay, but it was a pretty close call. What had happened was that the lift bag, out of control, had smashed into the ceiling on the way up, ripping it apart, expelling the air, and sending the weight crashing back to the bottom. It was a miracle no one had been hurt. So, Bill, what's your plan for today, then? Uh, well, we've, we've done the leak check here. Everything looks pretty good. If, if everything works right, we'll try going for 12 hours duration. See if I uh, if I can hold out in this suit here, and uh, if that works real well, then uh, next week we'll go for 24 hours. This is the first real test for Bill Stone's prototype rebreather. It has four onboard computers to provide automatic control of synthetic gas mixtures. It's a far cry from the simple diving equipment that was available back in the 50s. I guess the best way to describe it is you had a source of air, a tank of air, you had a regulator. You had a face mask you could see and a pair of fins to push you through the water, and that was it. Uh, there were no diving watches at the time. No submersible pressure gauges, which tells you how much air is in your tank at any one time. No buoyancy compensators to so control your depth. Uh, it was very basic. All of our early dives were made without wetsuits and uh, just a bathing suit and perhaps a, a sweatshirt over, over the top. And some Many times, not even that. We could dive, decompress at 20 and 10 feet for periods of like 20 minutes at 20 feet and then 37 minutes at 10 feet. And as long as you stood still, you didn't swim around, you could build up a layer of warm water around you that essentially your body has heated. And providing that nobody came swimming by you and kicked up the wash from their flippers, you'd be fine. But once somebody did that, then uh, you'd be very, very cold for the rest of that dive. As divers, we're all very excited about learning to play with Bill's new toy. Here, Rob Parker is being given a demonstration. Okay, Rob, this is your primary computer readout here. I'm going to create a couple problems, and those will appear up here on these prioritized messages. Um, you'll be able to see that over here on the, the computer system when I generate it for you. Okay, I've just created a problem for you. You tell me what it is, and I'll tell you what actions to take to correct it. Right, I've got high CO2 build up in stack one, 
but my gas supply in stack two is completely depleted. That's helium and oxygen. Right. So what you need to do at this point is to switch from stack number one to stack number two regulator, and then you reach over here and you reroute the gas supplies from number one to number two, and you're all set to keep on moving. All right. While Rob masters the intricacies of Bill's rebreather, the rest of us are still trying to raise the lost cylinders. We're down there trying to get the lead pod up off the bottom once we found it. And once we initially hooked up to it, we started moving it up. We, we lifted it up off the bottom and let some air out. And it fell right back down. We didn't want to lose control of this. We did it several times. And on the third time, we knew we had to put more air in it. We put the air in it, and it started coming off the bottom. And suddenly, it just started accelerating out of control. I was riding it, trying to hold it down. Paul was on top of it. I had no idea it would go the speed it did. It just started flying. So I bailed off at about 50 50 feet and I looked up and lo and behold there's a glass bottom boat all these people looking down at us and I said oh no we're gonna flip the damn boat over so Paul was still on the bag and I went get off Paul get off and about 30 foot I saw him rolling off the bag the glass bottom boat must have just seen it because it peeled out of the way and the bag came clear out of the water with 2,000 pounds of lead connected to it it was unbelievable With the lost weights recovered, we are able to resume the assembly of the habitat. Piece by piece, all the necessary parts come together. Our early trials and tribulations, by both necessity and desire, have made us a stronger team. And like clockwork, everything begins to fall into place. At last, it looks like our habitat will become a reality. The garfish are probably saying, Hey guys, we haven't had this much fun since the mastodons dropped in. To have a refuge, a place like this underwater, to be comfortable during the long hours of decompression, it's like having a dream come true. large orange beach ball that you see beneath me here is in fact part of a large underwater structure which stretches down over 25 feet below us and in fact is connected 85 feet down to a large deep level anchor. The way in which it works is we have a neoprene coated ballistics nylon shell here which is 10 feet in diameter and that is in turn filled from a surface air compressor which is supplied by this large black hose that you see right here. When this is completely full, it has an upward force in the water of approximately 16,000 pounds. 
Now, to make it work underwater, because this is a variable depth device that we want to use for decompression and recompression therapy, we have a bunch of counterbalance weights, which are suspended by three tubular aluminum space truss frames that go down approximately 14 feet below the hemisphere here. Theory's fine when it works, but in practice, it is the hemisphere's capacity to support its own weight that is now giving rise to concern. There's no way we can change the design at this stage. All we can do is carefully monitor the situation. Right, go ahead, Clark, what? That's it, Phil. Okay, you're too shy on the lead. You, you think you need about 500 pounds more? Okay. Why not, uh, your hundreds weigh about 125 pounds, right? Okay, so if you put four of you in there, you should probably be able to get it to go down. If we can do that, we'll buy another 500 pounds of lead and sink it. As it turns out, 500 pounds is far shy of the lead needed. It finally takes four times that amount to sink the habitat. What are you doing, Gavin? Well, what we're going to do at the moment is stack an extra one tonne of lead onto the, the pods at the bottom, because when the dome was originally designed, it was meant to shrink in the manufacturing process by 7%, but it hasn't actually done that, it's shrunk less. So the volume of air enclosed is a lot more than we calculated for, so the lead we've got on the bottom isn't enough to sink it. The one ton of lead does the trick, and the habitat sinks to the required depth. At last, everything is in position for the big dives to begin. But the next day brings more bad news for Bill and his team. You got a Bill. Take the what? Take six. <clears throat> it's gone down, but it stayed upright. It's slightly leaning, and it's just below the lip. You're kidding. No. Perfectly intact, it's not damaged, it's about half full of water. The winch is just above, just above water. But obviously did, it's did you turn the, uh, the compressor on? No. no. The thing is, if we if we lift it now, it's going to pull tight on the chains, it's going to break something, it's gonna hit something's going to give. Because that thing's going to take out of the water when it comes. This is a serious setback. We have not only to get the habitat back up to its correct position, but also ensure it cannot happen again. We're all stunned. If any of us had been inside when it happened, we could have died. What had gone wrong was that the air supply hose was not fitted with a non-return valve. When the compressor was switched off during the evening, the air had simply siphoned out, sending our precious home plummeting to the bottom. Four days later, after close scrutiny and testing, all problems with Bill's variable depth device are resolved. Over the following week, we all gain confidence in the habitat's design and function. We make dozens of workup dives, using our mobile home for more and more hours every day. Thanks, mate. That's better. Can you help fish out my two direct... My father always told me that anticipation was the greatest thrill in life. But by this time, we'd had about all the anticipation we could stand. Rob, Brad, and I were raring to get started with the real business. Well, Henry, how about a job that pole, now, Henry? Well, I'm ready to go. I've got 4,000. I'll be turning on three. Okay, I've got my air check. I'm ready to go. Let's 
go lay some wine. Leaving the surface, we're hoping to explore depths as great as 320 feet for up to 80 minutes. A dive like this requires that we carry a minimum of 1,200 cubic feet of compressed gas. Since it would be near impossible to swim with this amount, we use special high-powered scooters to propel us through the water. Our plan is to bring back the first film of this never-before-visited territory. After our journey deep into the underwater passages of Wakulla, we return to the main cavern. Here begins the long and complex process of multi-gas decompression. A variety of gases are blended together to achieve ideal desaturation. Time and gases required at each 10-foot increment are carefully logged. A total of 21 stops are required before surfacing. The final six will be completed inside the habitat. Five hours into decompression, Rob and Brad are cleared to enter the habitat. Relieved to be partly out of the water, they stand like penguins discussing the achievements of the dive. The habitat at a distance takes on the appearance of a space station with its shuttles docked outside. As for me, I'm bored. I forgot to bring a paper back. My favorite reading is short story science fiction. I can usually finish those before the pages start floating away. A little extra decompression? Huh? A little extra decompression? Yeah, I'm decompressing my karma. <laughs> I've gotten that several times. The first couple times, I really didn't know it. And I didn't even know why my shoulder was so sore. Really, really didn't relate it to them. When we got out of the water, I was in a hurry to get done with the dog. It had taken too long. And I started hauling gear out, went straight to the van with all my stage bottles, didn't even take my mask off. Went back and got scooters, and when I got in the van and started pulling my dry suit off, it just hit me in the shoulder. A sudden, hard pang. I knew I was bent, so I went home and tried to sleep it off. Got up and it was still hurting. Couldn't deal with it anymore. Call up a friend of mine. I knew he'd tell me, go to the chamber, dummy. I guess that's what I was wanting to hear. It was really hard for me to admit I was bent. They did 11 hours of treatment, but it's probably already too late. I've done permanent damage to my shoulder at that point. So now I'm suffering from it. I have to decompress a lot longer than everybody else and come up a lot slower. This is Brad. He's standing here with the camera at my nose. <laughs> Leo, man wants to know we're going to come up and get our food. The dive's really good. Okay, thanks, Maddie. Bye-bye. Are you hungry? Yeah, I'm starved. What's the matter, Leo? Uh, I think Monday's got a few surprises for you. 
We've got some potato chips here. All right. And some little pots of stuff. Do you want to grab that? Well, that sure is nice, Nancy. This really is a decent treat. I can tell already I'm going to be at the kitchen table here. All right. Hallelujah. Look at this thing here. Well, Mandy, this chicken is really foul. All right, who wants to, um, who wants to go? Anyways, no any good jokes? These guys were out on a ranch, so they had to cook. And whoever complained about the food became the cook. So, one of the new hands came on and he ate some food. The first thing he says, God, stuff tastes like shh. That's terrible, man. It's gross. Shitty tasting stuff. Everybody started laughing and going, what's wrong? What's wrong? Crappy food. He says, yeah, but if you're going to complain about the food, you got to cook it. This guy cooked and he cooked and he cooked. We saw him and he cooked. Nobody said a bad thing about the food. He said, I'm going to fix this. Somebody's going to complain about the food. So they went out and found the biggest old moose turd you could ever find. <laughs> they had a old moose turd pie. And sure enough, he put it out there and you know it. The biggest, meanest, baddest cowboy ever to come around was first in line. Black Bart. Well, old Black got up there and says, Give me a piece of that pie, boy. Boy sliced himself a big piece of the moose turd pie and started shaking. The old black took a bite of it. <laughs> oh, moose turd pie, but it's good. <laughs> yes, is Wes there? Okay. Hi Wes, I'm sorry we've got some sad news for you. Well, all that film you shot, it's all out of focus. Well, that, that film that you shot on your scooter run in there of Rob sorry and Dad. Sorry about life. We're really sorry too. Yeah. You can't do it again for us, can you? Yeah, it's going to be a hard twist and I promise you. Okay, well, thanks for not... Keep it a secret. All right, talk to you later. Hmm. Yeah. What's the problem? It's all out of focus. What's all out of focus? Everything you shot. The you mean the sitting milk stuff? Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, not a chance. have our different priorities. Those priorities are switched around. We all share the same interests, but we prioritize them differently. Certainly to me, exploration, science, and photography, to have explored the greatest underwater cave of all time. Pushing out, exploring, mapping, the sensation of going places that no human has ever been before. Uh, that all is very, very stimulating. We must always be careful to remember where we are and that we follow the rules that keep us alive. Can you imagine trying to find your way out of these caves without a line? Cave 
driving, exploring Virgin Tunnel, bringing home mapping gives me a satisfaction that I can't describe to anybody. self-reliant, to be in control of everything I do, and there's never a thought about the surface while I'm underwater in a cave. Never, never a single even flicker of the fact that surface exists. It's your choice, you know. Do you want to be thinking about other things when you're doing what's considered to be one of the riskiest sports on earth. All I want to do is think about how to stay alive and maximize the enjoyment that I get while being down there. What I realize about West Skiles and cave diving is that I'm going to get older and it's going to be harder for me to do the things I can do now, so I'll just change that with technology. Next step, saturation cave diving. We've got to be able to go in and out of a habitat that's constructed maybe even inside one of these massive deep conduit systems and have a month, two months, living inside of a habitat. And that habitat would be base camp for extended explorations into the aquifer. In the end, our team went to record depths and distances inside Wakala. The habitat proved itself sound and taught us that we could safely live underwater. Dr. Bill Stone's rebreathing unit was successfully tested on a single continuous 24-hour dive. Now, Val Dunick.